Hi, friends. Welcome back to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. This is John Kempf, and I've really been looking forward to the conversation that you're about to listen to. You know, the focus of the podcast has largely been on agronomy uh, because that is what I personally find interesting and fascinating. It's where I find the large areas of opportunities. But also, uh, in our work at Advancing Eco Agriculture, uh, we are constantly stimulated by growers who ask us challenging questions and who uh, contribute new insights to the work that we're all doing collectively. And one of those growers is joining me today, Bo Clausen from the Pacific Northwest. Bo, thank you for being here. Why don't you tell us a bit about the context of your operation, what your journey has been like and the scope of the work that you're doing today? Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's definitely an honor to be here. A little background on my farm and the family. Um, we are a second generation farm here in the Columbia Basin of Eastern Washington. Uh, my parents uh, started the farm in 1981. They were actually immigrants from Denmark, met in California in 1965. And uh, they come over uh, the last year, so you could come with an immigrant visa rather than a work visa. And they uh, met down there and decided this was truly the land of opportunity and kept pursuing uh, opportunities. And that uh, led to coming to Eastern Washington to the Columbia Basin. Uh, and working on a farms there. And in 1981, decided uh, that they would like to pursue their own farm and started on their own. And so since then, uh, we've been farming and started off as a mostly a vegetable seed growing. And today we've diversified into uh, mostly alfalfa hay, corn, wheat, and still some vegetable seeds, wrinkled seed peas, beans, wheat, triticale seed, and such. We also got a uh, cattle side of the operation started now. We are doing uh, cow calf, about 800 cow calf pairs and about a hundred registered Angus bulls on the farm. And we also have a feedlot on the operation and the feedlot on the operation is leased out to uh, another entity, but we maintain first right of the manure on the facility. And the manure is what we call our golden goose. Uh, the manure off that facility is what has enabled us to raise common crops together or are surrounded by high-end potatoes, onions, uh, higher-end crops. But because of the source of the manure, we've been get able to uh, get all of our potassium and phosphorus needs for the high-use crops such as alfalfa and corn. And that has uh, made us extremely competitive with our neighbors and our environment here. And that is uh, kind of how we come along. How long has the feedlot been a part of your operation? How long have you had access to that manure resource? So my uh, parents bought the feedlot in 89. It was uh, sitting vacant and bankrupt and bought it out of a scene that I had in a paper that it had come up for sale. Somebody had purchased it originally from the bank. It did not go through. And my father did not have the money to make the purchase, but it was something he felt he could not afford to let go. So he went to the bank, manipulated his numbers to make it look good enough to go. And he took what little cash he had on the operating line and put down on it. And uh, basically my father asked for forgiveness, not permission. And it's the, the best thing he ever did. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a joke, but uh, boy, he, I mean, what he bought it for was cents on the dollar. And it's the old saying, when uh, somebody looks at it from the outside, all I see is a mess and a pile of manure out there and my father saw opportunity. And so he uh, bought a manure spreader, an old truck and a loader. And uh, we started hauling manure out onto our fields. Uh, and uh, the facility had a shop and an old office and a scale on it. And it was uh, close to us. And so we started hauling manure out into our fields. And uh, the manure had not been hauled out for probably 20 years. They literally had board fences um, and stack boards higher. The manure was rolling over the fences, uh, probably four to six feet deep. Rather than uh, digging it all out, they would add these two by eight boards and uh, extend the height of the fence and raise it up on, on the steeper slopes of this facility. And there's mounds on there that were probably 20 feet tall of manure in the middle of these pans and uh, just beautiful manure. And that's where one of those deals where people look by and just uh, see a dilapidated mess and somebody else uh, sees opportunity. Somebody else sees a pile of gold. That's a little bit, uh, you know, we we hear about the, the, the immigrant spirit and that's a little bit of chutzpah to pull off a deal like that. 
Yeah. How how has your operation evolved on the crop side? You described how you had started out being a lot of vegetable seed production, and today you've shifted away from that a little bit. What has that transition been like, and how? what were the drivers of that? Yeah, so originally we, we started off with vegetable seeds, and a little bit that was back uh, in the 70s. My parents had connections back in Europe to some of the vegetable seed companies and got some uh, pretty good contracts for various crops from uh, kale, kohlrabi, um, mustards, turnips, just all kinds of vegetable seeds. And they were good, but even like they were tough financially because they're like, say the carrots, some of those, it would take three years before we would see money return on those. By the time you plant them in the fall and uh, raise them a whole nother season, <laughs> get them to seed production, deliver it. The, the companies had full control. They cleaned the seed, processed it, and decided how to market it. And we typically didn't get paid till uh, they got their money. So the money was tied up for three years. And uh, yes, there could be good money made, but it was um, tough financially to cash flow it. But we, we did that up to 89. And once we got the, the feedlot and the manure, father decided to try some alfalfa hay and a little more corn, knowing that we could grow that cheaper without the commercial fertilizer with just using manure. And it worked better than other people realized. <laughs> and for us too, it worked great. So we were able to grow those crops competitively. It might not have been as big of margins, but a lot, lot less risk. And that meant a lot to us. We'd rather have the stability of those crops than the volatility of the vegetable seeds. It's a very significant resource. Of course, you had that that initial uh, mountain of gold, as you might call it, with the the manure that was in the feedlot when you originally purchased it. But what do your manure applications look like today? What are your common application rates? How much are you applying and how much of the crop's overall nutrition is coming from that? So in the past, yeah, with the typical spreaders on the back of a, uh, call it a 10-wheeler semi, we were applying between probably 30 to 60 ton an acre of, uh, I call it uh, dry raw manure. It might be maybe 50% moisture, uh, maybe 40% moisture. So, and we would apply that at least once every three to four years. And my, my rule of thumb on, on the manure was based off of potassium needs with the, like say an alfalfa crop would be removing close to 450 pounds of potassium a season. And so I figured I needed uh, a minimum of between five and eight ton of manure to replace that. And so that's kind of where we ran with for many years and try to maintain our ground and, and stretch our resource out. So we would typically say with a 40 ton an acre spread, I was hoping to get, you know, four to five years uh, out of that if I could. And how did you, just out of curiosity, because I certainly have some very different perspectives on how phosphorus and potassium behave in the soil than they're commonly held by many mainstream agronomists, but I'd love to uh, learn what did you see in your soil profile uh, on soil analysis with PNK levels? Did those remain stable? Did they climb? Did you, did you deplete them? What happened? No, typically they were climbing uh, over the years. As the, for those rates we were put on, especially ground that had not had manure in the past, we would get those levels up to where it was sufficient where we could grow a couple years crop without any worry on the potassium and phosphorus. Today, I probably cut my manure applications in half just because uh, we've maintained those levels to get a certain point where I think is, is a better balance of nutrition than trying to overload the phosphorus and potassium. I, I'm a little more worried about imbalances than I am of total levels today. When did you start noticing that shift? How long ago did you begin reducing your application rates? When we started kind of expanding acres a little more and we started uh, diversifying out on, on, I call it new ground. And so those acres were tend to get majority of our manure and not our own fields. And, uh, but we, we still notice our old fields that had manure for say 40 years history, even though the, the fertility levels were lower than the rest, they were still producing. We were more concerned with the new acres that we had with the extremely low fertility levels on potassium and phosphorus that we wanted our manure placed there. and. We even went into composting uh, or somewhat composting. It's, I call it the more of a dried screen manure where we're processing it to dry it down, to haul it further, and then top dressing on alfalfa and to try to apply it that way. And that worked great. That was a, an eye opener where we got onto, I call it a rental fields that were extremely low in phosphorus potassium, no commercial fertilizer applied, just top dressing, dried screen manure. 
and uh, at roughly five ton an acre a year, and we can maintain eight to 10 ton of dry alfalfa hay production a year on that. And that led me to believe that manure was <laughs> more powerful than we realized. When we looked at the, the fields that we did not apply it on and for what it cost us to get that on there with and without, we realized that, yeah, that we, we really had something then. Well, when you think about uh, the constantly fluctuating but a continual upward trend price of commodity NPK, based on the conversation that you and I are having, then the perceived value or the price on livestock manure might go up across the countryside following this conversation. Well, it has. So when we started it in the manure, we were getting, when we leased out our feedlot, we were getting paid up to $2.50 a ton. So when I was in high school, I, I worked, you know, after school and weekends and the breaks, and we would haul manure and get paid to haul manure out of the feedlot and spread it on our fields. We got paid. Today, it's a highly competitive area to try to get access to that manure. That same manure in the back of the pen is probably worth 10 to $15 a ton. Wow. If you can get it, but you can't get it. It, it is tied up by a few loan people that have had the, the benefit of getting it. And those that are willing to deal with that product, it's, it's not a pleasant product to deal with, but when you realize the, the financial benefit of it, it is. And so in probably 10 to 15 years, it's gone from a liability to an asset. And it's even being used in our potato production now, where before they, they didn't want to see manure in front of it. Now it's almost a standard practice to apply even a light rate of compost in front of the uh, potato production in our area. So it, it changed quite a bit in the last few years. That is interesting because there are, there are many regions which have major concerns about food safety and putting livestock manure in front of potatoes or in front of a root crop or something like that. But Obviously, when times warrant it, then the research warrants figuring out whether it's actually a problem or whether it's just an imagined problem. No, 100%. Our local potato producers have to follow the GAP program. And so there is a timing restraint on that manure. But if they can get it early in the fall, previous to the crop, uh, and have enough time to be in the soil, then uh, they are okay. And then, but it has to be composted too. Anyways, they will not allow raw manure to be spread right in front of the potato planting in the spring. You mentioned a bit ago that on the soil that you've had, uh, you now have generous P and K levels from the historical applications, you're becoming more concerned about excesses. What have you been observing in your crops as uh, that, that is raising that concern for you? The whole reason I got uh, in touch with your program was manganese. And uh, I, I could not get anybody to explain the reason I could not get manganese in my soils. So it goes back to, I, I test my manure and my manure has twice as much manganese in a standard manure analysis than any crop would ever remove. If it did potatoes, alfalfa, hay, corn, I find the highest use crops of manganese, and I am applying twice as much manganese in my long-term manure program than any crop would ever remove. Yet my soil samples are extremely low, my tissues are low, and even my saps are still low too. <laughs> And I, I could not get a great explanation of it. Even my local lab was the only one who says it is there because he, he did my manures analysis and my soils side by side and says, why is it not showing up? And he says, well, it's not showing up on our testing methods. It is there, but it's locked up. And well, um, it led me uh, to you and uh, searching the, the, the web. The one first person that I started explaining the chemistry side of it, how you know, the interaction of the soils. And at that time I had, no understanding of soil chemistry other than just what a local agronomist explains what's happening what we're putting on and so that led me down this wormhole to where i am today from not that i saw my manganese problems but um realizing how much i don't understand of the interactions of soils and balances and that so that's where we are today is trying to find that interaction of the nutrients and the energy from those nutrients and, and the chemistry side and how to unlock our soils you know, Bo, this is this raises an interesting question, not not one that I w might sometimes ask on the air, but it's popping to my mind, so I'm going to ask it. And that is, given what you just described, the background that you came from, not not being deeply familiar with soil chemistry and, and nutrient interactions, there is this concept that is called the curse of knowledge. And the curse of knowledge, as it's described, is that when you understand a topic very deeply you forget what it is that you now know that everyone else doesn't know. And 
that can sometimes lead to things being communicated poorly, being explained poorly, or uh, making it very difficult to build bridges between the people who know deeply and the people who don't know. And I'd love to get your feedback on, as you started learning and as you started the, the pathway of gathering information and going down this wormhole, as you described it, what was that experience like? And what was, what was it like to, to build bridges or to develop new information? Oh, it's uh, the number one thing I, I did was try to get an understanding of the whys of what we're doing. I'm no longer relying on somebody else to make decisions on my soils and what's happening on my farm. I need to ask the questions and understand why, why were these recommendations made and, and truly understand it. And uh, that's been the biggest blessing I've had. And at the, at the same time, you start asking those questions, you, you start questioning everything now. <laughs> and, and today, after I like, say, yeah, this will be our third year with you guys, I have more questions than I did before because I've changed things up from what I've done and what I thought I needed to do. What manure program, I needed nitrogen and sulfur and a bit of boron. Those were the three nutrients that I knew I always needed and that that's all I was purchasing for 20 years. Last two years, and especially last year, I cut out nitrogen and to see what, see what would happen to my whole farm. I got no dry fertilizer, no fertigating of nitrogen. I only did a little bit of inf or I call it a infra or um, starter fertilizer with the corn. And then everything else from there on, from when the plants merging is all foliar. And uh, after going down that road, I have more questions. I, I only applied between 20 and 40 pounds of nitrogen on my corn crop last year on every acre, 1500 acres of uh, uh, had high moisture grain and silage corn also uh, a little over 600 acres of uh, or 700 acres i think it was for silage corn which uh, silage corn you want large vegetative plants mass usually typically it would be pushed in 300 plus pounds of available nitrogen for those crops uh, i applied 40 pounds and 25 of it was foliar 15 was on a starter anyways and after coming out of that my corn crops were good average. I, I don't have record yields, but I have good average. And doing the SAP analysis on it, question everything that what we're doing is, is uh, following your guys' recommendations on reading a SAP analysis on ammonia, nitrate, and total nitrogen gave us confidence that just to say, hold off, we don't need much, just a little bit. And I did a whole farm that way last year and uh, with success. So it goes back to starting to change the ways we do things and now we change the way of how we think our soils are working so so i i'm more confused now than i was before wait 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 yeah i think you just confused me as well so did you say you you had been at 200 pounds of nitrogen that was a minimum i was typically applying 250 pounds to i've gone up to 400 pounds of applied nitrogen and my yield gold was over 300 bushel corn is what my goal was. I wanted to see 350 bushel corn. And, and so when you use the industry standard of, you know, one to 1.2 pounds of nitrogen, that's where I needed to be. And so I was, uh, you know, always front loading a hundred pounds of nitrogen up front, like with urea. Then I'd come in and side dress another 100 to 150 pounds of anhydrous ammonia at the V6, V7 stage right before that rapid growth and then i would finish off the crop with uh probably yeah up to 50 to 100 pounds of uh of nitrogen liquid nitrogen there and to get a crop and uh so it, it was a big change on what i've been doing in the past that's, that's a very big change you're just talking about cutting your nitrogen rates by anywhere from well you're, you're left with 10 to 20 percent of what you were doing originally depending on the math that you use yes so the nice deal is when you look at nitrogen use efficiency, I mean, that's kind of call it the keyword that everybody's going off and, and everybody is tickled from going, taking that 1.2 pounds of standard from the universities, the local data we got to, I mean, most people are getting in that 0.6 to 0.7 and tickle with it and feeling they're doing great. My best field was 0 0.06 pounds of nitrogen where I applied 20 pounds of nitrogen and got 260 bushel average, but that was uh, an 130 acres, but there was parts of that field were 330 bushel also. So, but the rest of my farm was uh, 40 pounds of applied 
And so that gives me, I think, a 0.13 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. And so the kicker is everybody thinks I'm going to be mining my soils, but my soils have not changed. I've got, you know, take soil uh, samples every year and my soil samples have balanced, if not maybe come up just a little bit, but my total nitrogen in my soil seems to want to stay around that 125 pounds of, of total available nitrogen. And that's with organic matter being 1.6 to maybe 2.2 .2 on my farm right now, average. I'm surprised that your organic matter level isn't higher with all of the historical manure applications. Well, we're, we were heavy tillage. I, I love the plow. That was my favorite tool. <laughs> we plowed and uh, we joked that uh, my father had iron deficiency syndrome. He loved <laughs> iron and so my brother and I did too. That, that was our pride is having equipment and working ground, doing a beautiful job of plowing, leveling the soil and working it. So our, our history was to work the soil a lot. And we found we got really good stands of crops and on the vegetable seed crop, some of that, it was important. But now with our, our change of uh, practices, we've gone to strip tilling or I call it reduced tilling as much as possible. And so, yes, my, my organic matters have not, I'm going to say moved, but they have probably come up a half a percent in the last probably 10 years. But um, I, I expect one or two more years I'll see movement. This last year, I didn't see much of a movement on organic matter, but I, I think a couple more years uh, it, it will start moving because I'm just on the I, I'm on the early side of the whole farm or, or trying to reduce tillage as much as possible. Yeah, Bo, you've just unwrapped so much for us to dig into, uh, to have conversations. So before we dig into the tillage piece, because I do want to come back to that, you mentioned that this last year you did the your entire corn crop reduce nitrogen for that such a significant amount. What did that transition look like? Or what, did, what gave you the confidence to just do that uh, very rapid? I don't even know if I can call it an adjustment. It's like a, an, a, almost a complete about face. Well, the year before we, we played with it, uh, with you guys, and we took about 350 acres uh, of our farm and uh, went to a, a foliar only program and uh, no starters, just foliar. And the fields I did that on were as good as the rest of my farm. And so I had less foliars than I did two years ago. I think I did between three and four foliars only. This last year, I, I did a couple more on average. Anyways, I did less and uh, I maintained my yields, but, um, and so that gave me confidence that it could work. And uh, so then, uh, how do you put it? Sometimes in order to see the veritability of the whole farm, I decided to go call it a whole turkey. I, I took the whole farm and just did it because there was, I, I had fields that I still plowed and did conventional and I had fields that had not been tilled for four years, five years, and everything in between. So by doing the whole farm, I could see the different influences of all my fields rather than just trying to pick the best field that I think could sustain itself. And, and so it gave me a, a, a good picture of uh, what, what's happening on the whole farm. It might not have been the smartest thing to do, but there's a point you have to decide to change and just move forward and then deal with the problems. Us as farmers want to only deal with a couple of problems at a time and drag out uh, or whatever, uh, ripping off the band-aids slowly. Well, you know what, uh, sometimes just jumping in with both feet, uh, you can learn a lot more in a short time and get to where you want to be. And I 100% agreed with that going in on the, on the way I did. Yeah, you know, it's it sometimes seems a lot more risky to take that approach. And it's definitely sometimes uncomfortable to take that approach. But when you think about the growers who have made the most progress and whose operation has evolved the most rapidly, uh, almost all of them have taken that pathway, sometimes not voluntarily, sometimes by out of necessity where they, they didn't have a choice except to rip off the Band-Aid. In fact, frequently because they didn't have a choice. But you described, uh, if, if I understood correctly, you described that you did up to six full years, maybe six to seven full years on your crops this year and while while your application rates I and mean, you look at the quantities of applied nitrogen just as as one example of those being down significantly there's obviously a significant cost savings there in reduced input costs but how much are those being offset by additional application costs what what have your net economics looked like what i did last year i, I probably did more applications than i needed to looking back and so I just on average between five and six applications on corn, uh, they're, they're costing me $10 an acre for aerial application, whether it's a helicopter or a plane. 
So just just for on the high side, sixty dollars an acre extra was spent. Well, when when you look at cutting nitrogen by itself out from going from forty pounds of nitrogen where it used to be two hundred fifty, so you can cut out two hundred pounds of nitrogen out of the program. What's the savings in that? You know, at a fifty cents for easy math, that's a hundred bucks. You know, at savings right off the top. So that offsets the aerial applications. Now that there's only the upside potential because of foliar feeding and with the interactions in the soil problems that I have, such as with manganese, even some of these other micros getting in, my soils aren't right right now or balanced to uh, provide all the nutrition to the plants, but foliarly I can do it. And so by adding these mixes in with the foliars, I am keeping that plant healthier than I was before. And we haven't even got into the disease and insect pressure either. I mean, that, that's the whole side kicker. The benefit of, of this reduced nitrogen program is disease and insect uh, reduction. So there's a lot more upside in, in my mind than there is um, downside. So let's let's come back to the disease and insect pressure piece because I, I do want to explore that. But it is very common for us when we begin working with a farm uh, and going facilitating a transition as they as they want to begin using, uh, developing different outcomes for soil health and so forth. It's very common for us to adapt into what fits a farm's system. And so we frequently do a lot of either irrigation applications or ciders applications, whatever fits a particular context. And uh, while we certainly recommend the use of foliar applications, particularly as in as in your example with the, the manganese problem, it's uh, it's not that common actually for it's, it's very seldom that growers that we work with use foliar applications to the degree that you have, and so what led you down that pathway? What inspired you to go in the direction of foliar applications to such a degree? Well, because of with the manure program, I was always felt confident I had enough potassium, phosphorus, or the macros there. Uh, it was nitrogen was my big one, so I just needed confidence if I could cut out nitrogen, then everything else is call it micros or small quantities that I'm playing with. And then uh, um, it gets feasible to play with foliars in, where I'm not trying to put on, you know, 20, 40, 60 gallons of uh, liquid fertility or, or pounds of dry fertility on. So, so that gave me confidence. And then going back in the liquid and the foliar, when we're doing the sap testing or even the tissues, we're able to, as long as you do a couple uh, times a year during the, right before these critical stages of the plant, you can make corrections on the plant fairly easily in a short amount of time. Even if it's not that you're getting these up to high levels, but you can get a plant balanced to meet what the soil can provide. And, and that's that's what we have accomplished the last few years is uh, cutting out all of our basically macros fertility for the most part and replacing it with the, the micros and trying to get a balance there. You described at the beginning that you're, you had for quite a number of years uh, your primary three nutrients that you were applying were nitrogen, sulfur, and boron. And how has that shifted for you with the foliar applications? Are those still the three primary elements that you apply? No, nitrogen, yeah, not so much anymore. Sulfur, um, I've switched to using, uh, or trying the last few years using more gypsum. And part of that is on the soils. I do have a little higher pH soils in the, most of them in the about 7.5, I mean, call it 7 to 8.2. So by using gypsum, I'm, what I'm purchasing the gypsum for is the sulfur and uh, applying in a, a gypsum maybe once every three years. And that has given me, call it a, a bit of a calcium and then the sulfur. So that's meeting my large, call it the, on the, I call it a macro on the sulfur side. So I'm building that up. So then um, the boron, that one is still always chasing, just always applying. It's easy to apply anytime with the, any liquid product, you know, where they, I use a lot of solubor. I can throw it in a liquid mix in the, in the planters. I can throw it in the foliar anywhere. And so basically anytime um, there's, a, there's a pass going on, usually a little bit of boron goes on with it. My, my soil levels are still low on boron, so they're not balanced right, but my sap samples are showing that I'm good. So I'm meeting my short-term needs of the plant right now with with doing that I, i'm hoping over time yeah that uh i will maybe do other ways to build the soil up where i don't have to come back and apply as many foliars to meet my demands so what uh, in addition to sulfur and boron what other elements have you been adding or shifting as a result of sap analysis i know you you started by led you down this pathway was a desire to solve manganese which is easily solved with foliar applications but what what else have you been doing molly was a big one uh, 
Molly was one of the biggest, uh, like these last two years was a uh, really eye opening and easy to see on SAP. I had not played with Molly at all, but two years ago when we, we went on the, the corn crop and uh, we applied uh, one large dose of, I think it was uh, sodium molybdate <laughs> dry and threw a high rate in, in on a foliar and it, it shot the sap up to sufficient levels on those fields. And where I had not done it and even used smaller rates of Molly, um, they come up, but not to the, the, I call it the high sufficiency. And I did it again last year and it showed it holds the the sufficient level all the way through the season with one high rate of, of a molly application will hold it in the plant and, and maintain it the rest of the season so i can see on the sap where i got um five or six sap samples and i i put it after the third sap sample i did a high rate and you just see that that molly shoot up to i can say i think it's four and a half five and a half parts per million and remain there the rest of the season so that that was uh that's what you want to see. You, you want to go in there and, and, and see these uh, uh, analysis and show a uh, deficiency, do a foliar, and then see it maintain it at a high rate. And Molly did that, and it's done it for two years in a row. So, and the cost of some of the Molly or some of that is very low. And so, so I think that was going to say key to call it even call it a nitrogen deficient program that we got going on. So. So that was one of the aha moments we we noticed the last two years that uh, just on one nutrient we had not played with much and all of a sudden it's holding. Well, I think given what you described, there are three characteristics that stand out to me when I look at the the you might call it the radical shift that you made in your nitrogen management. It's very easy for us to just look at pounds of nitrogen versus pounds of nitrogen. That's the extent of the conversation. But the reality is you you've done several other things that have made significant differences. And so when I think about what is happening inside a plant from a plant physiology perspective, the presence of generous levels of molybdenum and the presence of generous levels of sulfur. And the third piece is putting nitrogen on the plant leaf surface instead of the soil. The combination of those three things can explain in large part why you have been able to have such a dramatic reduction in nitrogen applications while maintaining yields. It's not just one piece by itself. No, hundred percent. It's like everything is they're fairly complicated and lots of moving parts. It's easy to simplify and say, I just, just cut out your uh, standard nitrogen and just replace it with something. No, no, it's, it's a whole systems approach, but it's, a, it still brings you back to the question of what is nitrogen's role in the plant from the way we were applying it in the past. I question whether we truly need to apply nitrogen. I mean, it's, it's in the atmosphere, in the air. I, I believe biology and healthy soils, healthy plants can fix it now. Well, as long as you're doing tillage and applying anhydrous ammonia, you will need to continue applying nitrogen. But <laughs> <laughs> once you once you start shifting soil biology, then yes, that will change. So I question the role of nitrogen. You know, I, in my mind, it was nitrogen was to produce or the transition to produce amino acids and proteins. So the end re, end, end result is proteins. That that that's the end goal of, of the nitrogen molecule that's what we need well we cut all that out there and now mother nature is finding other ways to produce amino acids and proteins so what are other things that are going to boost amino acid and protein production yet and so when i look forward there's only benefits of, of reduced nitrogen where nobody likes to talk about all the negative sides of nitrogen the the disease the insects and all that except for the local call it co-ops i mean they, they love it because it's a moron theory or the more we apply nitrogen the more insects more disease and, and there's more sales and, and it, it's a it's a it's a great business model but but as a in ag now i think we're there's a paradigm shift of of farmers relying on um agronomists from co-ops or from sales to being able to answer their own questions or make their own recommendations. I, I think there's going to be a big shift in how um, people are applying fertilizers and what they use in, in the coming years. You know, I, I think there's one thing that we got right inside our work at AEA that we didn't even, it was kind of by accident rather than by design. You'd love to look back and say, oh, that was a really smart thing to do, but it just it was kind of accidental. And that was that uh, our consultants don't get paid commissions on sales. They are paid a very healthy salary and that is their con. There's, there's bonuses for performance, of course, and so forth, but uh, there's not a direct commission on sales. And 
that's a very different model from what the mainstream is. No, I, I'm hoping you're going to see that come out more and more as, as we go into the future. But um, you guys are, I can say, leading the way on that. And uh, I hope there's a shift that um, we, we get away from the standard agronomist, what uh, us farmers are used to, and going to be more of, I don't even say, like say paid agronomist or specialists that we rely on as partners to help us make decisions that, but it's finding these uh, agronomists that have a good understanding of, of soils and plant and standard farming practices and try to marry them all together. Because everybody knows uh, my farm is completely different than my next door neighbors that farms right across the fence from me. And everywhere you go in every geographic region is so diverse that uh, got to rely right. on boots on the ground, people in the field for the final decision making. That's such a great observation, Bo. And there's been this interesting evolution in our, our work at AEA where we started initially as a consulting company. We were completely disassociated from products. And then out of a frustration with the lack of product performance, we did become a products company. But we're now actually going back in the direction of doing more and more consulting um, that is disassociated from products, or perhaps you should say loosely associated with products, because that's what many people are asking for. And that's quite frankly, that is what we need to bring intellectual honesty and integrity back into the conversation with mainstream agronomy. Um, but I'd like to, let's go to the disease and insect discussion because you've, you've mentioned it several times. You mentioned again, just a moment ago, as you've gone through this transition, I, I know from firsthand experience on many farms, uh, what it means to reduce nitrogen applications and the effect that they have on disease and insect pressure. But many growers use a much more, um, gradual or there, there's not the degree of reduction of nitrogen. It's very common to reduce 30 to 40%. Well, you reduce by 80%. So there's a big difference in degree. So I would expect that to some degree, there's an element of, you may have seen results much more sharply and much more immediately and rapidly than, than other growers might observe. What what has the, that pattern looked like for you? Yeah, for the disease and insect, uh, just going back on corn, um, spider mites is a, is a standard problem around here especially late in the fall, hot and dry. And that's, I think my first fully applications were with you guys were for spider mite control. And it goes back to the cost of a miticide was upwards of $40 an acre, up to $60 an acre, depending what tank mix, mixes adjuvants they just decide to put in it. And so, so my mindset was when you guys talk about, you can suppress spider mites with a foliar with nutrition. It's like, Okay, so so I went ahead and, and uh, I think I spent forty five dollars an acre on nutrition in the probably the R two stage of corn in the reproductive stage, which is a critical time in corn for a grain field. Well, instead of putting a pesticide out there, I'm putting a foliar fertilizer out there, and, and it's balancing things that are already out of whack. So it's something the crop already needed. So it's a win win in my mind that uh, I, I go and spend say fifty dollars an acre on a foliar. I'm gonna hopefully suppress the insects and get a little better grain fill. That, that was on the corn side on, on my wrinkled seed peeper. So this would have been on your corn three years ago. What happened to the spider mites? Yeah, I'm going to say 90% of the fields are suppressed. Uh, one of a rental field um, on silage corn did not. And I come in with an insecticide later on because uh, I was nervous of finishing off the crop. But on, uh, I think I did on 1500 acres, <laughs> I, I did a foliar on all of it. And uh, I did not apply, yeah, I might decide on all the rest of the acres except for one one block on, on a rental field that uh, was a little too far. And, and it, it goes back to on the sap where the, the nitrate nitrogen was too high in the soil and releasing and, and could not overcome that. And uh, but the, the, the rest of the farm, when I looked at um, what was standard applications from uh, the local area and what I was doing, yeah, I by skipping out that that might decide, you know, that's I'm going to say I, I didn't save money. But there's nothing that makes you feel better than when you're applying foliar nutrition to benefit that crop at a critical stage. And like anything else, Mother Nature will tell you when things are out of balance. If the insects are there, things are out of balance. So all of a sudden, coming with the right nutrition and the right timing, I didn't have enough yield checks out there to say, no, what what was my ROI on that spray? But it, it's a given when, when uh, I'm still maintaining, call it a high average yields for the area, then it's telling me I'm still probably doing something right. So, so. What has your spider mite pressure looked like uh, since you've reduced your nitrogen applications? You know what? The, 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 there's they're light pressure still, but it, it, it's funny that my my soils are still producing 
nitrate nitrogen. I, I, it, it don't make sense. I have two years of no applications of a foliar or, or uh, fertigating or dry of nitrate nitrogen, yet my plants on a sap is still showing on some of these soils high nitrates in different times. And, and I can't explain it other than over time, over a couple of years, it does come down and starts balancing out. And, and I, I still wish I could understand it, but looking at the ammonia levels will be high, sometimes the nitrate, but the, and especially the total nitrogen. And what I've done in the past here now is my ammonia and nitrate have gone down to fairly pretty low levels, but my total nitrogen is maintaining. And, and, and so that is my, my canary it is that total nitrogen, wherever they're measuring that from, I don't know, but um, that's what I've gone off of the last three years on the sap. And as long as my total nitrogen levels on the new leaf and old leaf are sufficient, and I'm not worried about it. And of course you go back and do the visual, walk the field, look out there. I'm not seeing the firing off on the lower leaves either. So it, it is correlating to the sap. <laughs> That's so much fun. But actually, Bo, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that your soil continues to release nitrate. And I expect that will continue to happen for the next couple of years uh, until you start building up more soil carbon. But given the low levels of organic matter that you have and given your soil's history, with the tremendous manure applications and with the dryland environment that you're in, um, perhaps soil exposure to the sun, having a very oxidized soil, I would actually expect your soil to continue to release nitrate at fairly significant levels until we build soil carbon levels up to a point where that's no longer an issue. And then on the insect and the disease on uh, wrinkle seed peas has been always in, in my rotation for many years. And that was another one of those where, uh, went down the moron theory of a uh, raising that crop where we were kicking up more nitrogen, more applications and fungicides and getting this, raising this huge, massive crop that looked phenomenal, but it was really hard to finish off because uh, that crop and canopy would get so large and so dense and with our applications that we were coming in with uh, two to three fungicide applications and probably, yeah, from three to five fertigations of nitrogen, different timings of the, of the season. And uh, I went two years ago and just cut it all out and no more of the, the fungicides or the, the um, fertigating anymore. And I uh, just went to a, basically maybe two foliars during critical time periods. And basically I'm, uh, I'm targeting pre-bloom, that very early bloom time period there with the foliar. And then also um, in the early seed fill stage. As soon as the last petals are getting ready to drop, then I'll come in with the, another foliar to try to finish that crop off and, and help it. At, and of course, after taking a sap. And uh, with that, uh, we've done zero fungicides and had zero problems with powdery mildew on, on, on those peas. And uh, so basically no insect or disease. And yet I have been told by the, the seed company comes out and says, oh, um, th th there's a few insects out here. Can you spray? Can you, can you at least spray the methylate out there? And it's like, sure, kind of nod at him. I, I'll take care of it and, and ignore it. And uh, comes back a week or two later, says, did you spray? No, not yet. It hasn't gotten any worse yet. So I'm just waiting. And, it, and he agrees. No, it's, it's still not worse, but it, it'd be good. We, we like that insurance application. And it's like, okay, you know, I, I got it. I'll keep an eye on it. And, and I just ignore it and move on. And gone away with two years with the, basically no fungicides and no insecticides yet. Yet a standard program is to apply those products for that company to guarantee the production of the seed because of standard production. So it's been fun where with the peas anyways, because they are a low return crop and we use them for a rotation uh, to get our alfalfa hay in and establish in the fall. And so it is somewhat of a rotation crop and, and uh, not a lot of money to be made on it. But at the same time, when we start cutting out our inputs and uh, it, it can still be profitable crop, but our ROI on it, instead of having to have 45, uh, um, hundred pounds an acre of, of wrinkled seed peas, we can get under 40 and still, um, you know, have a break even, so to speak. And so, so that's been nice. And how have your yields been tracking with your reduced applications of pesticides and nitrogen? Biggest factor is usually weather on, on timing, but, um, they, they've maintained average. So yeah, with, uh, probably a reduction of inputs of, let's say a hundred to $150 an acre. You know, we're, we're maintaining the same yields. 
weather seems to have the biggest influence on the heat and, uh, uh, and the blooming time periods and holding on the blooms and finishing the crop off and then harvesting too that some of these varieties are real susceptible to shatter and uh, you only have call it hours or and not days to try to hit a, a proper window to harvest them you get in there a little late or wind and uh, half your crop the, the, the peas will actually pop open with the heavy dews in the morning and the heat in the day and the, the dry peas will start popping and kicking out the seed so uh, um, just depending on your weather so i hate to say it's it's luck but a, a lot of it is a, a little bit of timing and uh, getting things right so so bo as as you've been on this journey what uh what have been the experiences that really stand out in your memory? What surprised you? What was unexpected? Well, the biggest is that we do not need to apply macro fertility on our soils. <laughs> and where they call it NPK. I mean, that, that was typically what we have to do. Now, get an understanding of that. There's probably enough there if we treat the soils right that um, will sustain crops. So, so it, it's just a, call it, this is a paradigm shift. We're just trying to balance the soils. Um, we're taught to look at the plants above the ground, and that's a great indicator, but I believe what's below the ground is um, key for our success in moving forward. So um, my other big aha thing I had was earthworms. Always loved earthworms and all that, but rarely ever found them in our fields, ever. We, we would find them in our alfalfa fields. After four years of alfalfa production with no tillage on it, we would find a, a light amounts of worms coming through and then usually after that fourth year it, it would, our crops would go to uh, in the fifth year would go to potato production so it, they would get tore out of alfalfa hay and fumigated and go into potatoes and so then that took care of the worms <laughs> so but now we do not have potatoes in our rotation and no more fumigation i have fields that uh the earthworm populations have exploded i i still got a lot to learn on worms and are they everywhere or where are they? Because I'll, I'll have one field now that it will be loaded with worms and you go across the road and you can't find any. But um, in my mind, I, I, I like to believe they're there. They're just suppressed. And, uh, and, and when I say suppressed, uh, say that because uh, last year we, we had a field that was an alfalfa hay that we took out of uh, alfalfa hay production. And typically we were cutting, taking an early cutting alfalfa hay in the spring uh, and then coming back with uh, corn in that. And uh, this one field was pretty weedy. It was my worst alfalfa field production for three years. And I did not want to take that crop off and call it sell it to the neighbors for dairy feed because there was a lot of weeds in it. So it, it was um, between 15 to 20 inches tall average. And uh, I just I sprayed it out and then strip tilled into that and it grew a corn crop. And uh, that corn field went from my worst production on the whole farm of alfalfa hay to my best cornfield. It was, it was tied to, I got 290 bushel corn on that. But the, the side deal that it was even better than that was the earthworms. So when I went in there and dug, there was a few earthworms. I could get one to two earthworms per shovel full uh, um, in, in the spring, right after the alfalfa hay, in, in which was phenomenal. But after leaving that green forage crop on the surface of the soil to feed the worms, Wherever there was cover and canopy on that, in the end of the season, I could dig with a shovel full and get 15 to 20 worms. Wow. And, and so I uh, come to learn that you have to feed the worms. <laughs> they need food. Where even my typical um, strip till corn on corn is not feeding a green manure crop and, and the worms aren't taken off. But wherever there is a green, call it green manure or feed crop there for those worms, man, the, the population explodes. In that ground, it's still hard as a rock. I, it, it was still hard to get a penetrometer in the ground, but there was earthworm holes and activity. And even though, yeah, I could not push the penetrometer in the ground very well, it was taking water and it was starting to breathe. The final was at, at the end of the season, when you dig a shovel full in there, I found tilth. Yeah, I, I could see one to two inches of actual tilth. I, I, I never experienced that here before except for where the other fields I got to was where I, I did the foliar only reduced tillage after five, six years and the corn on corn and dug in there under that residue and actually felt tilt in these soils here in the Columbia Basin where typically there are heavy tilled and plowed. There's aggregation in there. Uh, the soils were starting to breathe and uh, it's coming to life. And uh, I tell a story about um, a neighbor, Frank or whatever is working with 
another fellow that works with you guys and uh, collaborating a little bit on what we're doing and sharing ideas and uh, brought him out there too and to look at it. And the same thing he says, you know, he's, he didn't know it was possible. You could see that either. And this is not, I didn't either, especially in one one season, it, it changes. And, and, and I'm not seeing it with alfalfa hay because of the, the heavy traffic and when we're cutting the hay and the bare soils and that, it's just harsh in the environment. But having that green manure crop canopy laid down on the surface and then the corn crop come up in canopy over the top of that, that was a perfect environment to feed the worms. And, and I'm going to say they went to, to explode it from call it two earthworms per shovelful to up to 20. It, it's phenomenal in one season. And so that also also gives you hope about cover crops and green and growing and all these side benefits that are never able to measure truly the benefit of. And, and you won't see it in yield, you know, all the time either, or it's down the road. But all these side benefits that we know things are, are getting right again. That's an incredible story, Bo. Thank you for sharing that. I'm almost always amazed at nature's deep resilience and her capacity for recovery. I still remember looking at some onion fields down the southwest that we've been working with for, I think, about six or eight months at the time that I was visiting, if I recall correctly. And we found some earthworms out in the center of this field that are hundreds of yards. Actually, it's probably safe to say thousands of yards from the closest fields that have had a cover crop or have had uh, any any significant regeneration work done to them anytime recently but all of a sudden earthworms start showing up just simply as a result of our soil primer applications and some previous crop residue being incorporated where earthworms hadn't been seen for decades and it's just like how did that earthworm get there did it cross those thousand yards were those egg cases buried in the soil that all of a sudden came alive when the environment the conditions were correct there's just so many instances like that. So there's there's the recovery from what appears to us to be almost zero. And then to the point that your story is such an excellent illustration of, it's the speed of recovery, just how rapidly it can recover and how rapidly it can regenerate when given the opportunity to do so. That's an incredible story. It's a mind shift on, on how we're farming of a uh, um, return. So just like that, that alf alfalfa crop, I could have sold it and maybe return $200 an acre, $150, $200 an acre profit off of that. Yet when I look back at it, when I look at the yields I got compared to my, my lower standard fields of say 260 bushel to that one of 290, well, another 30 bushel easily covers that $200 of uh, reduced income. Just on, on a one year basis, that, that's only one year basis. That, that is not taken into account. The benefit of the soil being right in correcting itself and uh so yeah so uh, it's wonderful to see that um we can change in a very short time i thought it was going to take three to five years like anything the transition to see benefits and reality is one to two years or I, i'm going to say you, you can change in one year on, on, on my instance and not have a reduction in income at all just by shifting where our priorities are on what we're doing whether it's tillage or fertility practices, you cut those out a lot and then shift them to a, a, another source of building soil health. You just mentioned a key phrase, not having a reduction in income. Um, I've over the last year and a half, I've attended several conferences where there were these presentations and even these scholarly articles being presented that define as you begin a transition to regenerative ag, there should be the expectation of a loss of yield, which I intensely disagree with. And what I've heard so far in our conversations that you've not observed a loss in yield, that you've been maintaining your average yields. Uh, but we've been talking about a couple of different crops so far, um, particularly the, the corn, the peas. We've mentioned the alfalfa. Uh, what are some of the experiences that you've had with the other crops on your operation, in particular in regards to yields and how you've managed them differently? Yeah, so we've been growing triticale for seed in the past, and that one's a little bit tough because when you grow for seed, triticale for seed, tends to get very large and rank and wants to lay over. And it's uh, typically in the past uh, pretty nitrogen dependent too, you know, the, and it's grown similar to wheat and uh, in that aspect, but uh, we have troubles on suppressing the growth in order to get it to stand to harvest. And uh, so 
uh, still working on it, trying to understand how to do that. Uh, we've been using the growth regulators in the past, up to one to two applications to do that. But at the same time as <laughs> your old phrase of stepping on the gas and the brakes at the same time, it, it just doesn't make sense. So why are we doing it? Find another way. There is other ways. So um, I don't have any triticale. Uh, I didn't have any last year or this year, just with the way the rotation is. But more than likely this fall, I'll have it in the operation again and get to play with it again. But uh, but that's one that I, I I could see the trend changing completely. And, and going on wheat, I'll, I'm more than likely to have wheat back in rotation. And I'm extremely curious on wheat is almost worse than corn on the nitrogen use to bushel. Where the, here they want two over two pounds of nitrogen per bushel. And, and now I question that too and say, no, I, I, I don't believe that's the, the way we, can, we need to grow wheat anymore. So I'm looking forward to uh, in the next year or two to, to grow in those crops again in a whole different manner uh, than what um, we've typically done in the past. And it's tough because what we've done in the past works. It gives us a great yield. I mean, the wheat yields here are, are some of the best in the world where the neighbors here are growing over 200 bushel wheat in the standard production. So they're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, with wheat, but there was still a lot of room for improvement. You know, as you were describing this, something popped into my mind. There's this quote that I've heard many times through the, through the years. I forget who it's originally attributed to, but something to the effect of nitrogen applications cover up a lot of sins. Uh, speaking of sins in, in the context of other nutritional imbalances. And the thought that popped into my mind is, I've also heard this I forget quite what the framing is. I think this was on a corn crop, and they said that the first 25 pounds of sulfur will replace 25 pounds of N. After that, there was a reduced impact, but for the first 25 pounds, there was a direct replacement that a pound of sulfur could replace a pound of N. And when you think about that framing for sulfur, it begs the question, for what other nutrients is this also true? So if, if the plant has adequate levels of magnesium and manganese and sulfur, and boron and all these other elements, then what, what is the true nitrogen requirement? If there are no sins to be covered up for, then what is the real nitrogen requirement when you have nutritional integrity? And maybe it's 0.2 pounds per bushel, maybe it's 0.4. I mean, we could probably do the math on the protein content and, and calculate exactly what is being removed in terms of protein content. Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thought or interesting idea of when we begin managing nitrogen differently. Then of course, if you're not using nitrogen to cover up your sins, then it requires addressing those other nutritional imbalances to prevent that from being a problem. No, no, 100%. It'll, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I'm looking forward to another year of uh, playing with the inputs again to see where I change things and it'll see see what the results are going to be. Nitrogen, like I say, was, was the big one, but at the same time, I wonder with the potassium, phosphorus, you know, do we, is our soils going to be providing that now? Do I truly need to be applying as much manure as I've done in the past? I hate to say that in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I could probably cut back my manure applications and potentially sell my manure instead. And because my soils have more than adequate <laughs> volumes of the mineral nutrition for the rest of my farming career. So why not um, move it somewhere else and not throw it out of balance? Yeah, I would expect that to be the case. That would be interesting to look at that data and see what happens. Um, a, a moment ago when you, you were speaking, if I heard your phrase correctly, you made mention of doing some work with corn on corn. And I find it really interesting when I go back to the literature of the 60s and 70s, they used to talk about how the fastest way to build soil organic matter was to grow corn and, and repeated crop years, sometimes for six or eight or 10 years at a time. Did I hear that correctly? And what are you doing with corn on corn? Yeah, no, I, I have certain fields that have been corn on corn for, well, it was some of the real irrigation, uh, probably six to eight years, corn on corn. And, and it just it is simple, you know, to, to for these small little corner acres to deal with. But the building soil organic matter, we, we did not see it because we were tilling. We were maintaining, so say I, I'm still maintaining 2% organic matter, but that is with the plow, full tillage. And, and uh, so uh, I'm gonna say it's probably better than it, it would be if I was not growing corn, if I was growing more of the vegetable seed crops. Typically, in, when you look back in our, our uh, soil samples from say 20 years ago with a lot of these small seeded vegetable seeds where there's not much residue put back in and root growth, 
organic matters are typically closer to 1%. And then look at some of the neighbor's fields that are heavily tilled are closer to that 1%. So, yeah, so I, I, I've gotten away with corn on corn on some of these fields in heavy tillage and getting to 2% organic matter. But uh, I think that's going to change here soon. I think my next uh, step to improve my yields is getting that organic matter up to three. I, I want to see that two and a half, three percent And I think when I, if I'm able to do that, say in the next five years, to, to start pushing those uh, organic matters, I think that's going to be the next step for yield. Where I was playing in the corn yield contest and trying to get, you know, striving for just yield and uh, wanting to get this, you know, over 300 bushel, 350 bushel and, and struggle with it. and could not figure it out. And, and the, the more I put on, the more my plants shut down at the very end. And, and they just had a certain yield cap that I could not overcome. And the more I figure out now is that uh, my soils have to have the ability to provide that extra nutrition from the beginning of the plant cycle to the end. And uh, that's the difference. I cannot spoon feed or force feed that plant for with my knowledge to get those higher yields. Me trying to outthink mother nature is impossible. So why, why not just try to let her tell me what needs to be done and look for the visual symptoms of, of a healthy soil, uh, you know, good worms, aggregates, structure. Uh, I think if, if I start getting that, I, I'm hoping to see uh, my manganese levels come up. Even with the pHs in the mid-7s, I'm hoping those will start dropping without a lot of amendments. But just changing my practices, even a crop rotation and such, I, I think my soils will come around on their own. So it, to an aspect, less is more on the, the soil health side. So less oxidizers, as, <laughs> as I learned from you, less salt fertilizers and tillage. Um, it's going to give me more return in the long run. And I expect to see yields to to bump up in the near future again, That knowing that my soils have a um, ability to provide more. When I look at all those different soils, I, I think that soils in their nature have a limited capacity of yield or yield potential. And it doesn't matter how much we try to overcome them. We, it is very difficult to find the right balance of added nutrition to overcome uh, a truly healthy soil. That is so well said and so well articulated, Bo. And as you're describing, you're you are in the early years of a transition. I think you're going to have so much fun ahead of you, so much, so much to look forward to, and so many fun experiences to to things to observe and things to experience on your farm. I want to say thank you for being here, for sharing your wisdom and your experiences and your knowledge. It's so valuable for us to be able to learn from each other and to have shared experiences. So. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to coming and visiting sometime. Uh, I look forward to that, too, and I have to say thank you, too, for teaching us all. Um, I put you as the forefront and leader on changing the mindset of how us as farmers think about agriculture and what we do. Uh, if, if it wasn't for you, your podcast, and teaching me, I would never be where I'm at today. Uh, it's... Uh, it's uh, technology is a wonderful thing. When we sit out there, instead of listening to the music on the radio, we can listen to your uh, wonderful speakers and uh, of all the vast knowledge and the different backgrounds and putting it all together. And uh, that, like say the last three years that has done more for me than anything that um, I've ever done in education and schools and local courses I've tried to take. I have picked up more from, from like I say, listening to a podcast and questioning the way we think about what we do and why we do it. Not just because my neighbor does it and my father does it, but it, even if we do it the same way, you brought out questions and, and put it in the limelight of why are we doing it this way and truly understand it and explain it. And uh, so, so thank you for that. And uh, it's uh, going to be fun moving forward in the next few years and, and watching everybody else get a better understanding of, of why we do what we do. Thank you for that wonderful compliment, Bo. It really, it really means a lot. We all, we all have our gifts that we bring to the world, and uh, I feel very fulfilled in the work that I'm doing. And thank you, thank you for that feedback. The team at AEA and I are dedicated to bringing this show to you because we believe that knowledge and information is the foundation of successful regenerative systems. At AEA, we believe that growing better quality food and making more money from your crops is possible. And since 2006, we've worked with leading professional growers to help them do just that. 
At AEA, we don't guess, we test, we analyze, and we provide recommendations based on scientific data, knowledge, and experience. We've developed products that are uniquely positioned to help growers make more money with regenerative agriculture. If you are a professional grower who believes in testing instead of guessing, someone who believes in a better, more regenerative way to grow, visit advancingecoag.com and contact us to see if AEA is right for you. Thank you for listening, and we look forward to working with you.